Hello, this is the Green Corn Rebellion Show. I'm Gregory Harden II, and today I'm here with Kate Bierman, who is the former city councilor for Norman's First Ward, I believe, and yeah. candidate for the State House in District 44 for the Oklahoma House of Representatives. Whoa, 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 stop what you're doing. Okay, if you like this video and you like the other content on my channel, please hit the like button on this video also go hit subscribe like right now and also when you hit subscribe click the bell so you can get notifications whenever i put out a new video so thanks all right enjoy the rest of the video how are you doing today i'm doing well how are you i'm doing great, great. um I was yeah. loving this weather today. I feel like yeah. after the cold the cold we've had, this was really nice. Yeah, it was it got just warm enough, not too warm, and the wind was great. Yeah. yeah. It was beautiful. Perfect weather. Um so <clears throat> first question I have here is where are you from and where did you grow up? So I am from Vermont and I grew up in a little town of 1100 people called Fletcher, Vermont, about 15 miles south of the Canadian border on the western side. And uh, 30 plus years later, that town still has only about 1100 people. Um, you know, so it's pretty, pretty typical of rural America. It's, it's not really gaining, but you know, it's also not really losing. Um, and that's where I grew up and I went to school there and then fled the state as fast as I could after high school to try something new for college. All right. Uh, episodes of the Green Corn Rebellion show are sponsored by Oklahoma Progress Now. Oklahoma Progress Now is a 501c4 organization focused on building progressive power in Oklahoma. Their primary efforts are on developing progressive content for a 21st century audience, coalition, and capacity building across progressive organizations and causes, and working to see elected leaders who are more responsive to their constituents and the needs of the many. Areas of focus include progressive messaging and communications, coalition building and resource sharing, and focused progressive policy goals. You can check out their Twitch live streams, and they go uh, live on Facebook on at noon, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Please support this organization. It's a really great organization. It's just getting started here in Oklahoma. Uh, thank you. Now enjoy the rest of the video. Um, let's see. In what all have you done prior to running, being on the city council in Norman? So I really, I got my start in politics. Uh, I graduated from high school when I was 17 and I decided not to go to college right away. Uh, but my parents told me, they were like, don't just work a job. You gotta, you gotta try and do something, you know, that's gonna look good on that college application. So I landed an internship in Senator James Jeffords district office. And I was an intern in constituent services. And so what I did was take the files of people who were struggling to access a federal program, whether it was Social Security or Medicare or VA benefits, and I had a list of very specific people that I would call in those departments to say, hi, you know, I'm so-and-so from Senator Jeffords' office. I need to talk to you about a client, you know, a client, uh, you know, case number, blah, 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 blah. And I would try and cut through the red tape to get them what they needed. And when I was able to, it was just, I mean, it was the most life-changing thing for these people. I mean, they were reaching out to their member of Congress to try and help with benefits, which meant that they, they were in a tough spot. Um, so from there, after college, when I moved to Oklahoma, I started volunteering at the animal shelter, and I was really distressed by the state of the animal shelter here. Uh, it was not what I was used to uh, back home, where they did not have really a pet overpopulation problem. So then I learned that there was an upcoming vote to build a new shelter, and it was a public vote, and I really wanted to join the city's Animal Welfare Oversight Committee to help guide the process of building that shelter and you know trying to build a better volunteer program 
so I did that for a couple of years and I really struggled to get my council member to pay attention when it came time to vote on something that had to do with animal welfare or needed to go through the committee. And I just felt like I wasn't being heard. And so after the 2016 election, I was feeling some kind of way. And mm -hmm. I went and talked to a few people and I was like, I just feel like I need to do more that like, I'm not doing, I'm not doing enough. Like I got all this pent up energy and someone suggested that I run against the incumbent council member because he did, had not had a challenger in his last race. And so, you know, the thought was, well, even if I lose, at least I'm giving them someone to run against and, you know, I can make him take positions on things. And I ended up winning outright in a three-way race. And that's what kind of, you know, propelled me to where I am today. That's cool. Especially getting to work for uh, Senator Jim Jeffords' office. Like, a, like I've read into that guy. Uh, he's very interesting. Well, and now it with today's politics he's a very interesting figure but back then you know plenty of people that are similar to his uh political beliefs uh i think the term we call them is rockefeller type republicans yeah yeah, yeah. and he you know i i kind of feel looking back i didn't i didn't realize it at the time but i feel now i worked there right after he switched parties mm -hmm. and he he compelled he wanted his staff to be exactly the way he was that we were here to we were here to not just you know do what we thought was right but to really help people and his constituent services office was one of the best like forged really good relationships with these agencies um but now looking back his his switching of parties i feel like he a little bit was a canary in the coal mine for what the republican party was going to become because he had been a republican his whole life yeah it, you know he had and and he had i mean i guess what you what we now would call maybe you know not a rockefeller republican but an east coast republican if yeah. there even are those anymore i feel like there are more of those voters than there are elected representatives but um you know they uh, he he just felt like his party had left him behind and was going in a completely different direction and i feel like now we're at kind of the the end conclusion of that fear back in you know the really early 2000s yeah um let's see so what are some accomplishments or things that you've been a part of while you were on the city council so city council ended up being in my opinion a very unique governing body it was not one that i really learned about much in college i got a very deep so i um uh, so it was a really unique educational experience in dc but it didn't really focus on local governance and the norman city council is a quote unquote weak mayor system or a council manager form of government which i don't think a lot of people really understand until they actually try to get something done with the city and then they realize how hard it is because we're more like the board of directors of a company and the city manager is more like a ceo or a coo that they're their role is the day-to-day -day operations. The board is to really guide the policy direction of the company, approve budgets and, you know, all that. So it's very difficult to accomplish your own policy goals when there's an entire city staff that has been around for 10 or 20 or 30 years and 50 or 100 or 200 council members and they've learned all the ways to dissuade you from being able to do what you wanted to do so it took me a couple years to figure that out um, at first i was mostly reacting to things and even some of my reactions to policies ended up as policy wins like being able to poke enough holes in the university north park arena project to bring it to a grinding halt. Um, I still think they have, might have a very long game that we weren't aware of at the time. And so it would not shock me at all if it came back in some form, but stopping that as a brand new council member was a very big win. And the same with the og &E franchise agreement. They came to us wanting us to rubber stamp an agreement that every single city and town in this state that they have service with has passed in that exact form for about 80 years. And they wanted us to just rubber stamp it. And we said, no, 
And they said, well, we don't negotiate. And we said we were going to take something to the voters. So they finally ended up coming back to the table and saying, okay, let's negotiate. And now we still don't have a signed franchise agreement with OG&E four years later. We're still negotiating, still working on getting some of the things that we want. So my reaction to policy were some big wins. Um, but once I kind of figured out how the process worked and how I could accomplish things, I realized that the bigger the bite you were trying to take, the less likely it was that anyone would swallow it. And so I started trying to identify the most impactful policies that I could pass with the smallest ordinance. And so the first one that I was able to get done was a changing table or requirement. Uh, the city of Norman did not have a changing table requirement in public restrooms. And so if there was a, an infant changing table in a restroom, it was likely in the women's room and not in the men's room. And so I was able to get past a, an ordinance that stated that for all new construction, there must be a changing table in both the men's and the women's rooms. And if at all possible, it should not be located in the handicap stall because that was some feedback I heard from the disability community was that there are a lot more mothers with babies, yes, but when someone with a disability needs to use the bathroom, there's only one stall for them. So can we put the changing table outside the handicap stall? And if you were remodeling, if you're remodeling a, more than 50% of the footprint of a bathroom, you would have to do the same and install changing tables. And that's a big one. I got so many calls and emails after we passed that from Others who now felt more confident that in new construction, they'd be able to bring their kids out and there would actually be a place to change them. And also from dads who were, you know, involved parents who took their kids places and wanted to be able to change them safely. And after that, I worked on, and it ended up being passed after I got off council. And I'm a little disappointed in the final outcome because it didn't end up looking the way we wanted it passed, was a visitability ordinance. And it was an incentive program to build more accessible housing right from the beginning. And I say more accessible because I got a lot of really good lessons from Metro Fair Housing about the use of the term accessible if you didn't meet all of the check marks on that list. And what we were doing wasn't that. So we called it a visitable, a visitability ordinance. And it had multiple tiers. And for each tier, you could apply for a rebate on the construction use tax, basically the construction sales tax that a construction company pays on the materials that they're using to build the project. And what I really appreciated about that process was that we brought all the stakeholders to the table right away. We brought members of the disability community, we brought builders, we brought developers, we brought architects, and we brought Metro Fair Housing all to the table to develop this ordinance so that it fit and that it, it fit what the disability community needed, that it was feasible to build, even just possible to build it and cost effective to build it. We put together an ordinance and we sent it to the city and it took a, over a year and a half to go through the slow grinding wheels of government and when it came out the other side, I was off council and it was, it was pretty badly gutted. And the incentive program had been knocked down to basically waiving the building permit, which is only a three to $500 waiver, which doesn't build most of what you'd have to build to make it a visitable house. So I was pretty frustrated with the final outcome, but I at least learned you know, how to get my own policies passed through a body that really isn't designed to kind of take some stabs at things in that way. Okay. Um, so what made you want to run for the seat in the state legislature? So in, in my four years on council, one thing that kept becoming very apparent is that the moment we, we as a Norman City Council said something out loud, if the st state legislature was going to preempt it, they were going to take the opportunity to. And so we watched the ceiling come down from the state lower and lower on our ability to do what's best for the residents of Norman. And we also saw that in pretty stark relief last year and this year with the state bans on mask mandates and you know handcuffing the school boards in that same way they are removing the ability of local governing bodies to act on behalf of their own residents when there is no apparent prevailing state interest 
And at the same time, we have also lost out on a lot of opportunities for intergovernmental cooperation. As a state, we don't, the state policy does not encourage local entities to take control of things that the state wants done. And a good example is this added funding for mental health that the state is putting into mobile crisis units and you know some other really great things. They want to run it all at the state level instead of empowering local communities to take some of that funding and implement a program that fits within a state framework. And because there are cities like Norman that want to do it themselves because they recognize that if you hire local people, train them locally and dispatch them locally, those people are gonna be better equipped to handle Norman's particular mental health problems and know the areas of town in which different kinds of things happen and who the local players are if they're dispatching a different unit from some state, some state hub somewhere, you're not gonna have the same level of understanding of the community that you're serving. So there's a lot of lost opportunity there. And I think it's largely because there are so few state legislators who have served as a local elected official. There are maybe a dozen and they're all Republicans. And the only one in the house is Speaker McCall. And so th that perspective really just isn't there to be able to empower local communities because it, there are so many ways that we can work better with the state and with the legislature as communities that we are missing out on. And at the same time, the state is trying to consolidate power at the state level and stop municipalities legislatively from doing what, what the city would like to do. Yeah. Um... <clears throat> When it comes to the state legislature banning, like I remember a few years ago, it was more than a few years ago, it was like eight years ago, the state legislature banned um, cities and municipalities from being able to raise their city's minimum wage. I remember yep. that. And I remember they put a ban on fracking bans for cities. Yes. On yeah. all oil and gas regulation, it's yeah. not even just a, a ban on fracking bans. It's even we're fighting in say we because I'm still in that habit of talking like like I'm on city council. The city of Norman is having to spend taxpayer Norman's taxpayer dollars to fight our ability to ask for additional insurance on oil wells. Mm -hmm. And it's not even additional insurance. We're asking for $2 million in policy and the oil companies would like to not have $2 million in insurance policies on some of these wells that are in the middle of town. Yeah. And if something happens, the cleanup in you know a more urban part of Norman is going to cost a lot more than if it's out in rural East Norman or yeah. even in Eastern Oklahoma. And yet the they are interpreting the state preemption law to mean that we can't pass any ordinance ever that even references oil and gas. <laughs> wow. That's we can't that's regulate insane. guns. We can't regulate knives. We yeah. can't regulate plastic bags. I I mean it's it's yeah, it's a lot. And this is from the party, the supposed party of local control. Yeah. Um it's it's crazy. Um <laughs> it's it's something that I'm also going to be talking about whenever I'm running because like some of the, like, I remember some of these things being passed whenever I was like in middle school and high school and I was just like but how like how is this even legal right. I mean I guess it is but like why would you want to do that like it just doesn't make any sense um, so and I get salty when I'm on my soapbox like that but at the same time I do believe that there are plenty of Republican voters who don't really necessarily care what gender someone can list on their birth certificate when they have to wait six months to renew their driver's license. Yeah. The line doesn't get any shorter if you're a Republican. It's still, yeah. It still takes you six months to renew your driver's license too. And, you know, I think they're starting, I think, they're, I think they're, they feel that. They want services to work for them. They want to know that their tax dollars are working appropriately. The little that we pay in tax dollars considering yeah. what, we, what oil companies pay and uh so but i i do think i do think that republican voters when it comes down to it they want services to function and they want to feel like their tax dollars are being utilized properly and 
I just don't think that the legislature is really reflecting the will of those voters either. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what are some of the main things that you're wanting to focus on while either in the legislature or on the campaign trail within the next year? So I keep saying, I realize, I realize I get to listen to myself talk and I feel like, I feel like I say the same lead in every single time. Um, I recognize that if I'm, if I'm elected in November of 2022, I'm going to be sworn in, you know, a month and a half later and expected to file up to eight bills a couple weeks after that. And so I really have, I really feel like I need to use the campaign trail as my own kind of bill development <laughs> time because I don't want to waste a legislative session. And, you know, I know, I also recognize that being in the super minority in the legislature means that I need to approach what I want to tackle very much in the same way that I approached my time on city council, that I, 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 think, I think it's possible to build bridges and find common ground on things that don't tie back to a national buzzword. Um, I don't think that that helps anyone. And I think it's really easy on a campaign trail when you're only talking to primary voters, especially in a district that's so heavily Democratic, and you know that the primary is likely going to determine the outcome of the November election, that it's really easy to overpromise. It's really easy to lean on those national warm and fuzzy Democratic talking points. But the next question that I hope any any person on the campaign trail would ask me if I start falling into that habit is to ask me how I would accomplish that. Because the answer to that is a lot more difficult when yeah. you live in a state <laughs> like Oklahoma. So I and growing up in a very rural community that didn't have great access to health care that did the best they could with the public education dollars they were given and made the best of it because the state actually appropriately funded education. Even though they were a rural community, they were able to provide a, a very good education to mm -hmm. the kids community, um, is go in at that much more surgical level. That's what I want to do because the things that benefit House District 44 voters are going to be the same thing that benefits voters in Guymon or Kearney or Sealing or Pink. <laughs> and so, you know, I want to, I want to really focus down on, on that level. Um, you know, Oklahoma City has a very good ambulance insurance program, EMSA CARES. And one of the things I tried to do in Norman was establish a similar program. I felt like maybe we had the population at that point to be able to make it work. And the hurdles I ran into were not exclusive to Norman. There are many communities that have public trust health systems, but, you know, for we're the largest community that has a public trust health system. And if we established an ambulance insurance program, they wouldn't be able to bid for that service. And I didn't want to carve out a community partner simply to get a program that I knew would benefit Norman residents. And then I started thinking about the residents, what the residents of Guymon and Kearney and Sealing and Pink do for ambulance, ambulance service. And I talked to a few people and there's a decent tribal capacity in some of those, in some of those areas, but a lot it's volunteer fire departments with surplus equipment that communities have been selling off to get new ones because it doesn't serve them anymore. Mm -hmm. And it made me realize that this would be a better program to implement at the state level. Let's look at implementing this at the state level and having it be a voucher program so that any ambulance that responds to a call can access this database to find out if there are, the patient is a member of this program to know how to properly bill it. And so those are the kinds of things, those are the kinds of things that we can do to reduce costs for Oklahomans and change how healthcare is delivered without calling it healthcare reform. Yeah. All right. Um, so <clears throat> how are you feeling about the coronavirus and vaccinations and mask mandates in schools or lack thereof, I guess, in some instances. How are you feeling about all of that? 
<sighs> well, a lot of this kind of goes back to the local control issue and the local voices directing that community's future. And so I would really love to feel like every school district is making the decision for themselves about whether or not to require masking in schools based on the data in that county. But we all know that because of the legislature, that's not what's happening. Um, and I feel the same way about community mask mandates. Uh, I think that I think that cities should be able to make that determination for themselves based on the data available. And they're not. Um, you might be able to see. I got I got my COVID booster today and I got my flu shot today. So I might I might be regretting that decision tomorrow, but <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to get my booster as soon as I knew kind of what my holiday plans were going to be because my four year old cannot get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. And that's that's why I still mask everywhere I go. Anytime I'm indoors, uh, unless I'm around only my close circle that I know is does the same thing, is vaccinated and boosted and has low, low contact with the outside world and unmasked. And I have to do that to keep her safe. And even even making holiday plans, it's been it's been a little hard um, because my whole family doesn't feel the way I do. And so, you know, that's been a struggle because my four year old probably won't be able to get vaccinated until next year, maybe the middle of next year, depending on how the trials go. So, you know, we, we still are seeing starting, you're starting to see increasing pediatric rates. That news has been coming out, you know, early this week that pediatric rates are starting to rise again. And, you know, we're still not in a great place considering the rest of the world. And so, you know, I do, I worry that we might have another variant uh, I worry that, you know, we're bringing a heck of a lot of vaccines here to this country, and there's a big old world out there that is just as deserving of vaccines as we are, and we've got a pretty hefty portion of the population turning up their noses at it when it could be going somewhere where people walk miles and miles and miles to go and get this vaccine. Um, so, you know, it, it, gives me a, it gives me a lot of heartache. There's a, there's a lot of components to it. It's a complex topic. Public health is never an easy policy discussion, and this is kind of a public health policy nightmare when when this issue has become just so just so fraught with partisan politics. So I'm feeling like hopefully we're going to kind of slide out of it, but it's certainly not going to be because we're getting the vaccination rates up where they need to be. I'm just hoping the hospitalizations stay relatively low. Yeah, me too. Um, so last question I have here is what kind of music do you, do you listen to or who are some of your favorite music artists? <laughs> so I grew up my so <laughs> I'm gonna, I'll start with the fact that my my mom and dad are 18 years apart. And my dad is very much listens to the music that he listened to growing up. So Frank Sinatra, Perry Como. Uh, he made me listen to a lot of Michigan marching bands because he went to the University of Michigan during their like years when they won national championships and everything. Um, and my mom was really big into Sheryl Crow and Fleetwood Mac and Reba McIntyre and Sister Hazel and Counting Crows. So that's kind of how I grew up. And so now I have really started trying to listen to genres that I never really listened to. And this year I became president of the Jazz in June board here in Norman and we're planning our 39th annual. So this is one of the longest running Jazz in June festivals in the entire country. And so I've been listening to a lot of jazz and blues, which I never really listened to before. And probably the top album on my rotation right now is Ghost Town Blues Band, their album Shine. And I'm really loving it. I listen to it almost every day just because it makes me happy kind of no matter what the weather is. It's just really good kind of toe tapping music. And then I'm also listening to a lot of local musician Cat Lock. She is absolutely fantastic. I don't know if you've ever listened to Liz Fair. 
but she reminds me a lot of kind of a millennial 21st century Liz Fair, and I absolutely adore it, and I adore her. All right. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, where, um, what is your campaign website, and where can we find you on social media? Yes, my website is beerman for hd 44com That's F-O-R-H-D number four, number four dot com. And you can find me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash beerman for hd 44 And please do not try to find me on TikTok because <laughs> the day I land on TikTok, it will be a tragic <laughs> day. I am an old millennial and I barely understand TikTok, but I really enjoy the TikTok videos that people post on Facebook. So, <laughs> oh, I feel you. Like I'm, I'm an older uh, Gen Z uh, Zoomer, even though that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> they're also on TikTok, but for me, I'm like, okay, I, I guess I get TikTok, but I'm not gonna like start making TikToks. <laughs> definitely not. Definitely yeah. not. I will be a TikTok appreciator, but definitely not a TikTok creator.